So on that first Pentecost, something indeed very special happened, and the author, uh, traditionally identified as Luke, knew the significance of this event and, and realized that it could not be overlooked or even understated. It, stand, it stands a, as a declaration to the world that, the, that God, the God of the patriarchs and matriarchs, of Israel, the God of the first century, in the giving of the gift of the Spirit, transforms the early believers into something new, into a living body, the body of Christ. So Pentecost reminds us, the community of believers, that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of of God's promise in Christ, that there will always be a presence always be a presence. God's presence will always be with us and among us. The gift of the Spirit is a fulfillment of that promise. We are never alone. And so perhaps Pentecost is one of the most significant events in the early church, but also in the life of Pine Shores. In the, in the church for today. Literally, it's 50 days after Passover. It was originally known as the Feast of Weeks, one of the great festivals which all good Jews would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And interestingly, it was originally an agricultural festival in which the community gathered and to celebrate the first harvest, the gathering of the wheat, and the offering of thanks to God. But at some point early on in Judaism, we know that the celebration of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, began to lose its association with agriculture and shifted toward uh, the preserving of the religious heritage of the Hebrew people. And so by the time of the Pentecost event that we heard today, it was primarily a celebration of God's gift of the law of Moses to Israel. 50 day period served to remind the Luke's readers of two things, it reminded them of the 50 days between Passover in Egypt and the giving of the law in Mount Sinai, and second, the Christian reader would remember the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and 50 days later, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And we hear about those who gathered that first Pentecost. They were Parthians and Medes and the Lamnites. They would have come from what we know today as Iran. Cappadocia, was a large Roman providence in East Asia, minor. Pontius and Pamphylia also came from Asia Minor, but the southern part. Cyrene was off the coast of northern Africa, and I'm just showing off now, because it's taken me 33 years to pronounce those names confidently. But what we do know is that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was not solely for the people of Israel. The Holy Spirit is given to everyone in the known world. So that means the Holy Spirit is inclusive. And in Acts, the theme of inclusiveness is replayed over and over again and again. The connective spirit gathers strangers together. The Spirit binds us together whether we like each other or not. Inclusiveness is the consequence of the giving of the Spirit. Now, what inclusiveness does is it it challenges us because we are indeed now asked to accept people who come from different places, to accept people who have different perhaps even conflicting interpretations or understanding of Scripture than ours, who perhaps even know God completely different. And 
may be whose lifestyles or choices are different and, and, and cause us tension of what is acceptable, but scattered everywhere in every direction. Everyone now can hear the message of God's love. Pentecost is a special celebration for us. And I just think it's so cool, and I believe not a coincidence, that the quilts were left up for this Sunday because there's something worth noticing. A quilt is a patchwork of cloth stitched together that forms something with a purpose. And a church is a patchwork of people drawn together to live with purpose. Okay, so I went to Grace Tyner's best friend, Google, and I started reading about quilts. You know, there's a lot to know about quilts and quilting. There's a lot to know. But I learned that there are four elements in a quilt. The first is the backing. Its purpose is to support the structure of the quilt. Next is the batting, which adds the warmth and volume to the quilt. When you touch them, you'll, you'll, you'll notice that. The third element is the top of the quilt. That's when the, the artist of the quilter can come out with colors and patterns and texture all blended and stitched together. And the fourth and final element of the quilt is the actual quilting which binds all things together. How sweet is that? The Pentecost spirit is that which binds us together. And I truthfully believe we need to be together, particularly when there is so much division. Think about the polarization and how polarized we've become. Polarization causes individuals on either sides to, in, to take increasingly extreme positions that are more and more and more opposed to each other. And as parties move toward these opposite poles, they define themselves in terms of their opposition to common issues or an enemy. Polarization diminishes trust. That's all it does. It distorts perception. It allows for stereotypes. And it lets us depersonalize others. I would say our country is depolarized, is polarized, is stewing. And the discontent is getting deeper and deeper. Suspicion and distrust. Fear is escalating. Democrats, Republicans fundamentally disagree on everything. All right, almost everything. Just about everything. Okay, on everything. Not only is there simple disagreement, but there's a lack of common framework. And within our denomination, we're still at each other. One group within our family declares that the actions of the General Assembly have made it clear that the PCUSA compromise of the gospel of Jesus Christ has reached an unprecedented level. It is clear that the PCUSA's confession of the Lordship of Christ and commitment to our Reformed confessions has weakened to the point that we can no longer assume a common framework of conversation. And see, all that I want to lift up today is the gift of the Spirit on Pentecost. The Spirit on Pentecost binds us together. So listen to this. Pentecost trumps polarization. Okay, that was bad, but it was funny. So let me say it this way. For believers, the Pentecost spirit disarms the negative impacts that result when we are not for each other, when we are polarized. And I want you to make note that those darn Parthians were in Jerusalem, and they heard it. And I don't like the Medes at all. They're worse than the Elamites, but they were there. The Cappadocians are all right. God, they, they, they got nice food. Pamphylias, they're acceptable. Boy. But they were all there, all of them. And we may not like that they were there. We may not like 
what they stand for or what they believe. But they were there and we can't dismiss, dismiss it or we can't ignore it. Pentecost binds us together to live with purpose. And our purpose is to be Christ-like. It is to be a people of good news, to share the gospel of God's love, to offer grace at font and table, to invite friend and foe to connect with Christ. It is to help create and nurture a more faithful community committed to God's compassion and justice. The giving of the Spirit on Pentecost changes everything about who we are and what we are to become. We are to be for each other. It has been written that the central message of Christianity is simple. It's about loving God and loving what God loves. And this means loving God as disclosed in the Bible and most decisively as revealed in Jesus. This message of the Christian faith reduced to its essence is love God as known in Jesus and change the world. And that's our challenge, changing the world. And on that first Pentecost, those believers received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it was sealed by an outward sign, the ability to speak in other languages, to speak as the Spirit gave them ability. And why is this important? Because today we need to learn a new language. We need to speak a new language. We need to speak a language that decreases polarization and increases the possibility of connecting others with the way toward Christ-like living. More and more people are growing up unchurched. And we have an unfamiliar, a foreign language. Think about a time when you traveled internationally and needed directions to your destination but could not understand a single word because they spoke a different language. That's what the unchurched feel about our language. More people in the U.S. have left the church because the language of literalism than for any other reasons. And non-Christian, non-Christians stay away from Christianity because of that same reason. The language of literalism is exclusive and guess what? Living a life with the Spirit invites us to be more inclusive. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard numerous times literal understanding of the Christian language used in dogmatic and sometimes aggressive ways simply to exclude people. So I would suggest that on this Pentecost celebration, we need to redeem and reclaim the language of Christ. We need to learn how to speak Christian again. And the late Marcus Borg said something like, being Christian is not primarily about believing a set of statements, teachings, beliefs, doctrines to be true. To suppose that it's about beliefs is to imagine that Jesus' purpose was to bring a set of true doctrines. Believe these and you'll be saved. Rather, he writes, the Christian life moves beyond convention to intention. It's about a way. The earliest name of our movement as recorded in Acts 9-1, a way. And when we are grounded in the way of Christ and grounded in the language of Christ, Christianity is transformative. Pentecost is about being transformed into a living body, the body of Christ. We have the Pentecost spirit here among us. And that is true. The Pentecost spirit is here and we are invited to become people, become a transformative people in a polarized world. And we are best positioned to counter to transform the negative and unhealthy imperatives that dictate the promises and the predictions and the possibilities that the powers and principalities offer us. We are best positioned because we know personally 
what is and who are most valuable in our lives. I want you to hear this. We have a language that can change the world. No, really. We have the language that can change the world. And by being intentional in our living like Christ, we can do that. Maybe one cup at a time, one person at a time, but we have a language because we have the life of Christ. So be intentional this day in the days to come about living Christ-like because that's what it's going to take. Each one of us has to be intentional about living Christ-like lives. And all of us need to be intentional together to be Christ-like. The world needs Christ, and we can be Christ to others.